Hello everyone, welcome to today's episode. A concept arose to me as As I was entertaining the idea of individualism in society, the wallpaper I have chosen for this episode, before I really dive into the title, is from a Japanese comic uh, show where the notion is like a world where 80% of the population are like X-Men. So we had the movie X-Men, like that was like a little part of the population. This is the flip side of that world, this, this uh, show. But anyways, the idea arose of what would a heroic society look like and if we magnified our individualism, our individual uniqueness, our idiosyncrasies, could they appear as, for example, powers uh, of a sort of... <clears throat> I'm thinking like right now, people are different. People are not clones. Their DNA is different. And you know how somebody has a different handwriting? people don't have the same handwriting. I find it like that, where it was as if like a magnification of a specific unique thing that the individual is doing. <clears throat> you know what it is? I feel we are practicing life. I feel that every person notices that there is a difference between how one self emerges in the world and how another emerges. <clears throat> the thing was, in the movie X-Men, their powers, the powers of the people in that film, or in, this is from, what was the show called, Boku? Hero Academia or something. For me, I these three characters you see in the wallpaper, they each have different abilities in the narrative, in the um, Japanese comic uh, book narrative. Now, I thought if these people all their three different abilities were just different types of handwriting then from that level you could see everybody has a different ability that means our ability may may not be like superpowers to like lift stuff or uh, you know have super strength or fast speed or um, <clears throat> to burst things or throw fire and ice like we don't have those powers but we have a uniqueness where it's as if the power of every individual is that they are getting a glimpse and angle of their collective. And the way this world is designed, it's not designed where it's, it's as if one solution to one problem. It's as if the problems emerge as fields and the solution also emerges as fields. That means, think of it this way, that a burning house goes on fire and everybody in the neighborhood gets a bucket, you know? Not like an empty bucket, like a bucket with water. <laughs> it's like there's a burning house and somebody just goes to the store and buys a bucket, not even for the burning house. <laughs> the person just needs a bucket. You know? But, I, but I, I was just sharing this notion that you may seem like someone that may get overwhelmed by your civilization, by your society. That's the whole point of history. If it's not a challenge, it's not worth writing down.
So my whole point with this episode is that we all have different DNAs. We have one type of educational system and 8 billion different types of DNA. Yeah, they, they, we learn the same as if, you know. <clears throat> we are very unique. Our inner realms are unique. And that's what I find to be the superpower of the human being and really the emergence of the heroic society. Not, say, not per se a heroism burst on the ability. You, think, you see, it's as if... Um, we um, imagine all these three characters you see in the wallpaper they each have different abilities in the narrative as I mentioned before so these three people imagine again we bring it back to the handwriting level and it's as if their abilities the we have microcosmic power in observation <clears throat> every person whoever you are whatever value you think you are whatever whatever way you have been acknowledged, either you have been honored by your species or dishonored, whatever. There is a uniqueness in place on an evolutionary design level. That means it's a beautiful world that we're not all clones. We're not all copies of one another. Sometimes I think people don't want, have you noticed that when someone agrees with you, it's not that you have less respect for them, but it's as if there is less something new being added. I always wondered about this. There was a time where I felt, when I was younger, where I was like, why is it that the chaos is more interesting than the order? And I realized, because the order has nothing to lose, but because in moments of chaos there's something to lose, the person fights back. <clears throat> that means it's as if the person, here's the thing, you can see this in any situation, that whenever there's a group of people and a new person emerges, the familiar is less exciting. So when someone agrees with you, that's a familiar moment, it's less exciting, but when someone challenges you, that's a new moment. Anyways, my whole point is, if we... <coughs> If we found a way to see that everybody has a uniqueness that can serve the species, but the task is finding the right moment and the right time, you know? I'm just saying on a very microscopic level, we are incredibly different. But in a macrocosmic level, we're in the same world, in the same situation you know, orbiting around the same sun. It's like the person wanted to have a light conversation. So, you know, they turned around and said, you know, so, how's, you know, we're orbiting around the sun, you know. <laughs> What's that all? <laughs> Now, I wrote something down here, guys, before I decided to start the talk. I decided to go through first an explanation of what I feel society is, and then an explanation of what the how the hero archetype is going to be displayed in the future, and really the ultimate conclusion, what a heroic society looks like. The magnification of uniqueness, I just wanted to get that idea out there that you may think you are... Um, inferior but when you zoom in on your intelligence you you will feel superior it's just the nature of zooming in when you zoom in on and something it becomes important you know
Society is behavior's evolution into worlds that more, more than one being can acknowledge. The emergence of the tribe is the emergence of a need for the value of the members of the tribe. That means if, if, if the individuals don't need one another, they don't need to be in a group. That means certain small groups, it's like certain band members, like when they're really small, they're like, all right, you know, let's go our own way. You know, but if it was like a hundred man group, then it's as if there's a commitment, there's an investment. Similar to how the weight of an object increases, when the size of a project increases, it requires more strength. And more its strength for a project means endurance. That means you want to see the weak entrepreneurs from the strong entrepreneurs. The strong entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs never had an option of discontinuity. Even though there may be failure. Failure is natural. If there isn't failure, you're either in heaven or somewhere, <laughs> or in some other dimension of no error. You know, for me, there's, that's the beautiful thing about life. It's sometimes p the flaws of, like, I don't know how many people in this world have truly, um, they've been truly in love. But when you're in love, you're not caring about, uh, per se, the flaws of the individual. It's as if the ultimate conclusion on the individual has been, uh, there is something more significant than the flaws, you know. <clears throat> and there was always something like that, you know, in my, in my own life, you know, as a man evolving, I've, I've wondered why is it that there were some, some girls that I just instantly approached and some girls I, 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 I liked but I couldn't approach, you know. And it wasn't about appearance. It was just about the story the person is telling themselves. That's the key thing in life, that your behavior is uh, a response to... A sort of stimulus value system in the moment <clears throat> you know you can see someone so superior that you will always feel inferior in front of them and you can see someone so inferior that you will always feel superior in front of them you know I saw this in the in, uh, in I saw this in my own personal life in regards to the evolution of ability that when you are doing nothing it's very easy to doubt someone uh, where you don't you can't see what they're doing you know, it's as if in the, in the darkness, it's, it's easier to doubt if they're enemies at all. But it's also more of a dangerous kind of walk, you know. <clears throat> Imagine how many soldiers, how many human beings on this planet they had to, <clears throat> like soldiers. Maybe just simple people who never, their, their names got, uh, went into the history books, but they guarded their value. That means, you know, there, it, it, in one strange, in one way, yes, it's like nations having borders is, is kind of like the separation of the United Nation. But at the same time, it's as if, like, it's honorable those defending the walls of their country. You know, for me, it, it's very complex, the concept of military, because its intention is violent, yet its purpose is nonviolent and noble. Do you know? <clears throat> it's as if when warriors would return from the battlefield, they would celebrate it. The giant bells back in the day in medieval times would hit and people would know, the, uh, you know, our heroes have come back. But those heroes knew they were not heroes. They knew that there was a level of suffering in this world that whoever you are, it's as if all that we can do as creatures while we're here is to just respond. <clears throat> that means someone sitting and meditating their whole life, in, in, in Mr. Within's view, I would say my view, it is, you may on some level be like, wow, that person has a nice focus. But if that person meditates the whole life, if you dis let go of this world, then you have forgotten why you're in it. This is why I can tell the sign of wanting to exit the dimension, this plane of existence, is a sign that you have no idea why you're here. And if you have no idea why you're here, you will in some sense be thrown around. You know? There's, um, I share the mystic poetry of uh, Hafez, the Sufi mystic poet from, what is it, like 900 years ago or something. Like, <clears throat> and Hafez, 
This man was a mystic, and in mysticism, mysticism is not for the faint of heart because it's a revolt against the edge of the psyche. <clears throat> what would happen? is that the mystic would find a moment where there would be no evolution beyond an ideological sacrifice. That is the type of heroism that we need in these modern times. A heroism that is sacrificing self-centered emotion for the potential of collective emotion. Do you know that means? Do you think of it this way? <clears throat> Imagine you, ha you are a company owner right now, and you have a lot of employees. Let's say you have 8 billion employees. Do you want, <clears throat> or let's say you have uh, employees. Let's say, let's make it 8. Let's say you're a company, you're the ninth person, you know, first person, and then you have 8 other people. Now, when you want your business to succeed, okay, do you want only you becoming successful, or do you want the, your company becoming successful. That's the difference. That's the whole point. Do you want an um, individual human being to be successful or do you want your species to be successful? And what does that even mean? Should we even ask that question? And yes, we should. You know, everything in nature, every creature in nature is like, please human being, look at yourself in the mirror one more time. <laughs> You know, there have been moments where I feel those moments were bl blessings, where I was inserting conflict and <clears throat> it was as if, you know, human beings and their attitudes like angels, hidden angels to the moment, or hidden heroes to the moment, You see, the hero is one step underneath the angel archetype. The difference between the angel archetype and the human archetype is that the angel archetype, I remember reading this, it was a very clear distinction, that the angel in, you can say, a theological standpoint, uh, <clears throat> is the will of the creator. The sunbeam is the sun. It's the sun's traveling far. The angel doesn't have free will. It is under the administration of the divine will. It is the human position that we really can experience individualism. <clears throat> that means it, human existence is, the, is one of the only uh, interesting uh, um, stations of conscious living where you can break. You can experience yourself break. From a metaphysical standpoint, I will tell you, you can experience physics here, you know? <laughs> because if our physics is based on the known, our metaphysics seems to be based on the unknown. And unknown, the unknown, doesn't need to learn teach itself. That means it's like a riddle. How do you get an unknown teaching? How do you learn something in an unknown way? Well, it's very obvious. It has nothing to do with how you have learned knowledge. There's certain times in life where the person gets out of the vehicle and it's like, why am I even in this vehicle? You know, you get out of that um, <clears throat> uh, subjective architecture and you notice uh, the designs of a better realm. <clears throat> so...
So anyways, this Sufi Hafez, I was sharing that in his poetry, it's very, mysticism isn't for the faint of heart, and really what it is, is that Hafez said in one of his poems, the divine, his experience with the divine, it, his imagery was so intense. It was as if, like the truth of the universe, he's, he was saying it, writing it in his poetry, that I'm just sharing the image, it's not, this is not the way he wrote it, but it was like, he said it was as if the divine, the true the true presence of the universe grabbed him by the hair and pulled him around the room. In his image, in his poetic imagery, he means that. That means it's, it's the kind of moment where, where the lover is born because the self is not in sight as the most immediate subject of the moment. That means there's moments where, yeah, if somebody says, how are you doing? Of course I'm going to be, there's, I'm self-centered in that moment. The, the attention of the environment is going to the self. <clears throat> but moments where it's about an event outside of myself, that's the remarkable thing, that I have noticed actually two events. One event is the objective event, which everybody experiences in the conscious waking state. We, the objective event, we appear as a watcher of the world. So the objective realm appears as if it's being watched. Now, in, in mainstream and whatnot, what do we say? We say, all right, so what's watching the body? And some people are like, hey, man, you know, have you lost your mind? Have you found your mind? It's the mind. The mind is the watcher of the body. That is truly what it means to have a mind, to be aware that there is a body in a world. Self and world projection exists. Now, the next question comes, what is watching the mind watching itself? So that means as if we are not just a purely visible being, we are a simultaneously a visible and invisible being, but because the visible is what is referential and can move and can change, we feel the invisible isn't there. And that's the a similar idea of the process of magnification. You know, that means there have been, I have, I have walked past many of the ideas I'm saying to you now since my childhood. So many, uh, thought is like an invention. That means the moment it emerges, it's like it could have always been there. You know, it could have, it could have, um, somebody, it's like somebody could have got, got it to it earlier. You know, <clears throat> for me, I was thinking, what is the way that the human being can work in this planet that is the highest efficiency. And I realize there's three, I mean, there is three dimensions to it, but I'll share two of them. In this world, we're either working with what we know, or we are working anew with what we don't know. And that was the thing, that when I started caring for the unknown, the space between the sentences, the words became clear. Then you can read your lifetime as if it was an ever-present book. Imagine you are someone who can whistle. You know, whistling, not a big deal. A lot of people can whistle super easy. You know, it's just a certain uh, angle The you know, you have to be and you just blow and the whistling happens. Now, whistling is not a big deal. Somebody whistles, you know. Imagine a girl is walking past, like you see it in traditional old school movies, you know, where the girl's walking past the construction site and then there's the wolf whistles like <laughs> <laughs> So imagine, you know, that girl could get offended. It's like, what is this? You guys think I'm just an object? You <laughs> <clears throat> and little does that girl know, that's just how those people know how to communicate in that moment. But here's the idea. The girl would get sad that it's like maybe she, the girl would get upset that the wolf whistling is like ingenuine kind of 
thing. But check this out. Imagine suddenly Godzilla stepped out and these construction workers are beside this girl and Godzilla's in the street and suddenly one of the construction workers who did the wolf whistle is like, I got this guys. And he suddenly whistles, but the whistle sound is so loud that it just cracks through. Like it makes Godzilla break like an opera singer singing a high pitched volume at a, you know, champagne glass. Do you know what I mean? So you would see that whistling was inferior and meaningless, but when the guy whistled and broke Godzilla like a gla like glass, imagine. <laughs> this is, of course, a hypothetical momentary situation, you know, that has come to my mind. <laughs> but the whole point is, the whistling would not be suddenly so bad. That girl could live with that wolf whistle that was there one day, you know? You know, I had, I had heard somewhere that there is this sort of idea that the more people stay like children, the less they want to actually see the world. The less they actually want to live in the world. Because the child mentality is like, world, move me. Please, world, you know. But as I believed it was Terence McKenna where he worded it so incredibly, he said the, something like the ethnocentric breastfeeding needs to stop. That means for me, if there is racism, if there's a person who's racist, that's a child that hasn't grown up. That's a child that doesn't understand there's more than the toys of one's self-belief. There is more than your eyes in this world and that's an honor and most people are scared of that. They think they're scared of the unknown. They, you know, we want to bunker down in certainty because what do we do with uncertainty, you know? And what can you do with the void, which is the ultimate question. That means in one of my talks, I said a sentence that a while back I listened to it and it made me cry. Because it was as if I, in one of my talks, I said everything I have been doing in life is as if preparing for death. And I've, I, that sentence I heard in my own talks, it, it shook me. It shook me in the sense that I noticed that every mind at any moment in the space-time continuum can also notice the space-time discontinuum. The discontinuity of the experience as a creature in space that changes, that can also be conscious of the change. So we can say that one thing is for certain, that change will change. How change appears now, it will change. Many things will. And this is where the, I say the era of, advanced of the advanced communicators has begun. But I feel um, what I'm saying is passing over, you know, they're like birds flying too, too fast to see the bird's beauty. You know, the idea of the advanced communicator is a suggestion that our, cre our species is becoming conscious of language. Because if you think your language, law is uh, a restriction. If you realize you're a creature from be, uh, beyond thought, beyond language, you are the observer of the words that you identify with or the communication that you express, then it becomes different. Then law becomes beautiful. Law doesn't become something, I mean, even though, of course, there's corrupt politicians everywhere, you know, it's just like there's good apples and bad apples. You know, some apples fall from the tree and they rot. Some apples don't. You know, some apples have worms in it. Some apple don't. You know, some politicians have certain motives. Some politicians don't, you know. And I feel the task of the voters of any nation is find the honest one to vote for. Because the honest one has less fear. The honest one is like what is is willing to walk into the battlefield, but the dishonest, they have to change the battlefield. They have to change what the battlefield means. Because here's the thing. If anybody has true power, they would not need the concept of power anymore. It is only those who don't have power that power is important to them. Anything right now that is important to you, you'll notice it's an absence. 
For me right now, the advancement of civilization is important because I don't see an advanced civilization. You know, and you can say there's been, uh, you know, dictators were once children. And imagine a dictator was a powerless child. A child abandoned, pushed. You know, for me, there was this in incredible revelation that people don't communicate just to share something. They communicate to release themselves into the world of their knowing. That means, this is why when someone is sharing something and you interrupt them, they have to begin again. Because for them, it's a performance. When I realize, oh man, how adorable. Every human being, every conscious creature is performing to themselves. Now, if, they're wa if they have stepped beyond their inner realms, they actually relax ideologically in the moment. Do you know? But if they haven't, if they are fighting language, you can see these people from a mile away. And the reason I, I can notice it is because I used to be a person who would fight language. But little did I realize I was the one also, uh, it was as if I was fueling both sides of a war of my inner realms. You know, that means I was creating my suffering and my joy. Who knew? <laughs> You know, imagine when someone calls you and it's like, hey man, can you talk? And you're like, no, I'm busy. And the person's like, what are you doing? You're like, I'm just unconditionally experiencing joy. You know, guys, the greatest thing that man can do is frown at the beginning and smile at the ending. Do not seek your heaven early. Let heaven find you like a butterfly that you have not chased. A butterfly that landed on your forehead because you were among the flowers in this garden of existence. The whole point of this episode, guys, is that we are individuals. We have each our uniqueness. So technically, we are X-Men, but without the physical powers. The powers are in our inner realms. Every person alive right now, technically, the civilization is, right now, it's unupdated. It's civilization 1.0, fax machine level civilization. Civilization 2.0 will be like Jarvis. I don't know how many people know what Jarvis is. Jarvis from like the Iron Man movie was Tony Stark's AI kind of... I mean, in later movies, he animates, but like... <laughs> he becomes a character. They're like, yo, man, what if we make Jarvis into a character? <laughs> but the whole point was that in Iron Man, um, Iron Man had Jarvis as a resource, as a backup, as someone who as a machine he could trust. And civilization right now is a machine we cannot trust. It's a mechanism that we can't uh, trust. That's why we have to have that animal alertness when we walk out the door. I don't know, what, I don't know if people are like this. You could be the softest, nicest, most cuddly person, but you're going to realize that this is you're in a jungle still. When you realize you're in the jungle, the weak mindsets die off quick. 
you know, there's a saying, they say the weak die first in battle. And so when one really takes a true approach at who they are and they're like, okay, where am I? What is this? What's going on here? You know, <laughs> you know, for me, like it, life is like literally someone ran into a room and it's like, what's going on here? You know, <laughs> that's, that's how it feels. It feels like an entrance into a location that there needs to be an effort to become familiar with. Not a location that one can assume just, just the way the eyes are open, the eyes are open. Okay, guys, so interesting <coughs> comment. Um, Love Schopenhauer um, says... Um, businessman, to me, business is all about materialism, not so you're good at. Well, I think you like Musk because your dad got you a Tesla. <laughs> I wish, man. Um, no, the, the situation is, is this, that you fear business because there is a narrative there are some people who look at money, here's the thing, imagine money, people say money leads to greed, correct? Money, and because money leads to greed, how could it be a pure act? You know, how could God get his hands filthy with coin? You know, like, so let me tell you, here's the thing, that for me, it's nature, and nature doesn't care. Human beings care for ideology, but nature, go, you know, go and give a talk to uh, a lion and see if the lions cares you know go give a talk to any other species and see if they care the human language is only important and crucial to human beings how you define things is the dictionary you have decided uh, for yourself how to keep your idea for me ideas evolve I through all the years of my life there there's it's like if you see money as food do you know it's as if saying like if when you desire to eat food is it evil? Are you impure when you eat food? Are you, are you less of a human being when you eat food? Are you more of a human being when you don't eat food? You see, no. It is activity. It is the stories you tell yourself that limit you from uh, the better. <clears throat> For me, there was a mentality that any dimension, anything in life, you could see a light and shadow to it. You could see a dark side to anything. You could see the most selfless renunciate also as a fool. For me, it's just the phase. It's like you can, sure, you can paint the people as bad, evil, uh, you know, materialistic fools. Or you're just like, this is what's happening. This is the event. That means, do you think history cares about your complaint? Love Schopenhauer. <laughs> In the chat section, do you think nature cares what we call it? That's the thing. It's energy. Money is energy. It's just energy which it, the way you attain it is not so moral. That's the issue. So you are considering, so I would say, love Schopenhauer, you, you are connecting business to materialism and not realizing it's a living being there. And if you see yourself as immaterial, how could the person counting the money be, a, be matter? Do you know? Do you see that means? It's, it's as if it's easier to see the world be wrong rather than for us to update our perspective. That's part of the uh, child's mindset where it still sees evil rather than being a practical designer to the moment. What evil? What evil in a changing world? What? It's phases. Not that there isn't evil. Not that there isn't messed up stuff happening. I'm just saying that you must give yourself a permission. You know, it's like someone saying, uh, you should only have one cup in your cupboard. You should only have one cup. If you have more than one cup and you're one person in a household, then it's as if you're evil. You're, you're like the same as the billionaire. That evil billionaire in the mansion. <laughs> like the Simpsons. I don't know why the Simpsons paints that picture. You know, there was a time where society held 
um, there were enlightened societies, guys. Don't think that just because we've experienced a messed up societies and messed up leadership that it's not possible to have a better system. This is just the prototype we're living in. So you forgive the prototype of your civilization, but it doesn't mean you don't build civilization 2.0. So I'm telling you, not only business should be an issue, I'm not even saying, I, the only, listen, the world becomes a, a problem If you don't put more effort for the solution, that means in life, if you don't put more effort for towards the better, I mean, what else happens? You just are left in the past. <clears throat> I feel like the past is a mountain and we're always trying to get to the mountain peak, which is the present. And in the present, what do we find? Like, what is the point of being in the here and now? I'm asking this from every person who identifies with some sort of category of the New Age community. So love Schopenhauer in the chat section I'm just using your comment man I'm just using your comment to um, uh, tackle a bigger problem that it's n there that people in society it's all about what uh, emotional resonance they're put in that means it's as if you can say the rich have less reason to be violent and the poor have way more reasons to be violent Okay, let us, let us just entertain this notion. <clears throat> now, karmically, imagine you were a yogi analyzing their karma of the poor and the karma of the rich. You would see the rich has less physical suffering. So technically, from a yogic standpoint, the, the Buddha was the child of an emperor. And then there, this whole thing happened, it's as if, like... You know, it, it's as a, but anyways, hear, hear me out here. <clears throat> the issue is, is that if you, you declare your value as a human being, that means imagine there was no capitalism, no socialism, no communism, no spectrum. It was just you had opened your eyes on a blank page. You would see that the value has to be created. You know, now I, there is corruption in many systems, but I feel we will get to a point where there will be a purity of skill. Where civilization, where work is going to become like uh, the artist's craft. Do you know, I honestly feel there's going to be uh, a sort of builder era that's going to com come maybe after 2050. Where right now I'm saying before 2050, let's say before the... Uh, predicted technological singularity we, which we need to be wary of communication needs to advance that means I don't know how long I'm going to be in this plane but I, I know that if I was here more than 50 years or more than 30 years I would totally shift the gears from focusing on advancing the communication to actually reinventing Sociocultural games. That would be the focus then, I would say. I would say in 30 years, it would be a totally different game to play. Right now, communication needs to advance because creatures are emerging in a global stage, and in this global stage, there is complete unfamiliarity. So, the best thing is we need comedians. There's so many comedians in the world talking about random stuff, and it's fine, but we need comedians trying to tackle like here's the thing whatever when someone speaks 
They are speaking about an image. <clears throat> when that comedian is on stage, and he, let's say the comedian is improvising, the comedian is talking, it's called crowd work, they're talking to the crowd. They, the guy says, hey man, what's your name? <clears throat> and the guy says, like, imagine my name is Lao Tzu or something. And then the comedian suddenly in his inner realms, Lao Tzu, oh, the Chinese philosopher. And he looks at the guy and says, hey man, where's your white beard? Everybody laughs. Ha 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 ha, Lao Tzu, white beard. Oh, we get it. You know, <laughs> so I'm saying that, I'm just saying that it's, It is very easy to see a system's value as empty. That is the easiest thing to do. Emptiness, we're all, we all start off as nihilists. <laughs> Every child born is like a nihilist. You know? There's a reason, uh, you know, uh, Hitler couldn't use propaganda to, to, you know, brainwash little kids. Like infants, like a newborn baby. Because the newborn baby isn't an individual yet. You see? And that's the cool thing. You have to declare your life to your own life, poetically, as I can say. That's where value emerges, inner value. Because you could be someone who could be seeking your inner value from the outer realms. If you do, you become like, um, um, <clears throat> you're more like in dog consciousness rather than in cat consciousness. <laughs> Here's the thing, you, once you get comfortable with the unknown, then you appreciate a present, the way you're being present as intelligence in this universal sector. When you appreciate that, Sorry, guys, got interrupted. <sighs> guys, pretty much I'm saying that we are moments of sight, moments of sensory, like the sensory perception is the walls of the conscious world. And for now, the greatest system that we have found in modern times is to identify problems and solve them. And the solutions, let us say, have been from outside, but the hero is how from the inner realms, the inner realms care for how the outer realms move. That means that's the thing. Heroism is born out of simple care. Do you know how many people on this planet, <clears throat> in, in these, like, like the whole archetype of the mentor and the mentee, the, the reason the mentor taught the mentee was because the mentor saw his younger self in the mentee. Because really, when you know you can help, you help. But if you don't feel you can help, you see there's a selfish angle to help as well. You know, helping people. I think the only selfless angle is if you comprehend that your moment is the whole moment. That means what will happen, I find, that if I, for example, if any, what happens for human beings that when they transition is that they become, they just sit in the watching chair, like as if you're, it's like life is happening like a cinema now, you're, or like a roller coaster, right? You know, there's certain, like right now, there's an incredible opportunity for the display and expression of effort as a being. But in other dimensions, you're more like a wind. So we are like a wind that is being a person for a little while.
or we could or I could say we are like a field of consciousness or like a wind that is moving the leaves on a tree and the leaves feel they are alive so Schopenhauer um, I just noticed something you made a comment in the chat section, you said everything is permitted in a, in a world where there are no powerful vain glory. So you're saying everything is permitted, but then you're saying instead of powerful vain glory. So how is everything permitted? You see, that's the challenge. When you see chaos and order are both citizens. It's human beings. Technically, there's, I would say, it's just attention. There is no good and bad people. It's where the attention is or towards what geometrical outcome what outcome it, it, is, it is going towards. For me right now, sight is very instantaneous as senses. I'm looking at that tree, I notice its colors, I notice the leaves, I notice the background, I notice the sky behind it, I notice the blue and the white, and I notice the shadows, you know? <clears throat> and when you look at a tree branch, uh, let's say behind a white cloud, you see there is, a, there is a contrast. For me, we would be an advanced civilization when chaos and order have become like two, two wings of an airplane. It's all about piloting. So, let's take this somewhere. <laughs> Let's take this to a heroic society. Society equals behavior uh, or multiple, multiple points of behavior in the same room. M multiple points of unknown behavior. We don't know what people are going to do. Unknown behavior in a known room. Let's define society as that. Now, let us define the hero as the evolution of the unknown behavior. The unknown potential behavior, let us say, of the individual point in the known room. Of an, so, right, we are right now wondering about the unknown um, potential of human beings in, on one planet, pretty much. That's what I'm saying. And so the hero would be the expression, the actualization of the unknown potential of the individual. Now, that won't be actualized unless there is a sort of transfer, a sort of uh, transaction. A transaction of the unknown energy of the individual attention to the specific shaping of the story. For me, sometimes that hero sacrificing himself, you see it in movies like the Avengers or whatever, that hero is like the, the, the master's, the master painting's like a final brush stroke for it to complete his masterpiece. It's like an event of completion. So you can say the, the super villain has, has uh, ambitions and goals and a vision board and the superhero has an ambition <laughs> and a vi has a vision board and they're both trying, you know? So the thing is, we have to create a new story. Children have to enter this world realizing that it should be more... It should be easier to be strong than to be weak. It should be easier on this planet to be great than forgotten. It should be easier. I could see it in my inner realms. It's like right there where I see that the systems have advanced, that we have cared. They haven't advanced because suddenly a, a, we got a sacred secret, you know, access to technology. It was, it, it, we, it advanced because we care to see where the strings, once we pulled it, where it led. <clears throat> there was something I'm not proud of I did, and it was so foolish. I was such a fool. <laughs> um, in, in my calculus class, 
I had a very, I had a very high score, in in the in calculus in high school. So I felt I could. I don't know why it was my. It was all foolishness, youthful foolishness. But um, anyways, there, we had this very um, bless him. Um, we called him Mr. Whelan. You know, he was this very intense uh, math teacher. You know kind of Scottish Gaelic math teacher of course he was like a scientist scientific scientifically minded but when when there would be religious kids in the classroom he would do this Gaelic prayer like in omni patria fili spiritus santi like he would <laughs> it was like it was like a math teacher though he was an incredible teacher i think it was a privilege for me to see see that man teach but i even though he didn't he didn't like me that much though i'll be honest <laughs> And I wouldn't blame him at that time. But uh, so the thing was that he shares this story in class and suddenly from this complex just mathematical note-taking session that usually follows in his classes, you know, after he teaches, it, it, there was a point where he shares a story. He starts like, you know, that's a smart teacher where he sits and actually talks to the kids in the class like a human being, not like a, you know, artificial statue of, you know, this is what teacher robot program is. <laughs> <clears throat> like seeing a teacher act like a robot that's uh ew, it, just, it makes you cringe <clears throat> but um anyways uh hopefully we will have an educational system where teachers will become lions they will roar at their students you know but uh, anyways <clears throat> so mr whelan he shares the story <laughs> that he he he's like of course he's a man in his like 60s you know and what time and so he went he said he went to this wedding like people asked him how was your week or something he said he went to this wedding and there he would get he got this sort of pink what do you call it um uh, some pink uh, roll of roll of string and he like connected it to a needle and he put the string outside of the pocket of his suit at a wedding you know so he wore a suit at a wedding, and so in the inside pocket, he put the roll, and he just put the string outside, and he would go to little kids in the wedding, um, <clears throat> and for example, um, uh, they would pull the thing, you know, the string or whatever, right? And I made a silly joke there, <laughs> that it, it, was, it was like a one time, like suddenly I, I noticed something where it was like, <laughs> Anyways, I make a comment, the class laughs, when Mr. Whelan is like, what the <laughs> Sorry guys, I'm giggling my attention away from the top. <laughs> That was the point of me sharing this story, that that string, that's like your intuition in life. And when you trust it, the intuition at first may appear as you may have a theosophical relationship with it, but then you're going to realize it's nature. It's just nature happening in an unknown way. And that's the true advanced communicator, where they can notice the event of the moment. It's very complex how the, I, I know the shift is going to happen from individuals. We're right now at the, I say, the phase of conscious evolution where we are a conscious self and we are using language as a cocoon and the metamorphosis process in the future is going to be a collective. Uh, we're going to be conscious as the whole world. <clears throat> right now we're conscious as a part of the world, as a part of the mo content of the moment, you know. That means if you're saying you're just your physical body, that means like you're considering your mind as a projector. But if you feel you're your mind, your body is a projection of the unknown into the instantaneous known. It's something like that. So I would say the healthiest way for us to see the human being is that it's an ever uh, endlessly updating picture.
and this means the instant eradication of all reasons for war. Because no one person is drawing the whole meaning, because there is 8 billion beings here, 8 billion human beings on this planet, which is just a remarkable event. It's like, it's like what do we do? <laughs> what do 8 billion creatures do on a rock in the middle of nowhere? Like, that's the game to play. The only game, I would say, that is right now very crucial. Life is just unknown. If you don't fear it, you can appreciate the known. If you fear it, you won't even care for what you know. Ah, <clears throat> the hero is the unknown potential of the behavior actualizing. And now we have to think of the, to have a heroic society emerge, it has to be rationally more, more, it has to make sense that we, here's the thing, people are getting, making money on this planet in so many ways. <clears throat> and there's some ways, let us say, that are more in the shadows, the corruption in the world and whatnot. Now, I'm thinking that corruption, sure, on a, design, uh, on a story level, moral level, yeah, that's fucked up, what do we do with it, about it? But on a designer level, they're just human beings who are trying to get an outcome. So if the person could get that outcome in another way, they wouldn't be violent. You see? So the issue is resources, really. <clears throat> and the thing is, though, how you attain the resources suggests if after you've attained the resources, you're going to have a lot of issues or a few issues. That's the crucial thing. If you're strong, then you can walk honestly in this world. Why not? That's one thing I noticed that potentially it could have happened, that in human nature, it's as if all of history could be a lie. We could look at the word history and see, oh my God, is it his story? And who's that his? The winners of history. Those who had the pen in their hand. The issue is language is like touching thought like an object <clears throat> and you can say that when you start treating your subjective experience as an objective existence the inner realms are freed. I feel every person's mind is leashed to the pole and the axis of their attitude. That means it's as if, you know, it's as if like an engineer hearing the karma and wanting to, wanting to take the hood above the engine of karma, this cosmic en karmic engine, and being like, all right, what's going on? And we come to the stoic conclusion that the programming is behavioral, but the, it's not just behavioral, it's as if we are here to be antennas, and if we fail to be so, there's consequences. And the consequences are not wrath of some unknown divine agency. The consequences are... Cell are evident. They are cause and effect like. 
You know, it's like caging a lion and thinking that's a lion. You know? That means for me, I would say if you want to know that your child isn't smart, you know, I, I mean, maybe this is too harsh. <laughs> There's no such thing. I mean, smart is a cultural construct. But I could tell you that the zoo is not where the real animals are. I wouldn't, I, like for me, they could just put a robotic lion in the zoo and it would be the same thing. Like, I don't understand why we, we're still having zoos. You know, they should just make robotic versions and children go touch these robotic lions, you know. Because it's not the real lion. It's not the free lion. It's the lion when you take it out of the natural environment. You know what it is? The same way we're studying animals, you know, by caging them and studying their psychology is the same way like taking the human being and putting him on Mars and being like, let me see what a human being is. No, the human being in a human world is the human being. And so for me, I was like, when, oh my God, a butterfly is on my head. What is that? Anyways, guys, what was I saying? Um, what was I saying? Okay, looking under the engine of karma. No, no, no. Some, I went somewhere else with it. Where, what was the last sentence? Uh, okay, whatever. Let's go from the engine of karma. Ultimately, it's an event. Just like you go to an EDM concert, you know, <laughs> it's similar to, it's similar to that where you're participating in an event, but the variables are more extreme. There's more at cost, you know, you can leave the uh, concert and not care about the place you partied, you know, but the planet is different. When the person's alone, they got to care for the uh, same place where they're partying in, you know? So anyways, let's conclude somehow. The heroic society is when the individual has found its most efficient strategy and when the collective has found its most efficient strategy. And there is no perfection. We just, things are good enough and we get by. That's the best strategy. There's never a perfection. Like, here's the thing. This is what I realized. It's hilarious. When you don't have victory, victory means a lot to you. But when you have a lot of victories, it's no longer victory that's important for you. It's like evolution, you know? Evolution of sight. For me, guys, um, anybody who's new to these talks, I think, love Schopenhauer, you may be. Um, my whole view is that language, there's, I've created this idea, I've designed this term, the language threshold. And it was, it, I think, I personally feel this is the most important concept on this, in this plane of existence, where we reach the limits of language. But experience continues on.
Okay, guys, I tried. The things doesn't work. <laughs> All right. The heroic society means we care that our inner realms are unique and we share them. And by sharing them, that's kind of like the same heroic society effort where <clears throat> our differences don't cause a disadvantage for the species. Our differences become an advantage for the species, for the civilization, for the advanced civilization. Because that's the thing in this life. It becomes very hard, meaningless to function in this realm if you don't build something. If you don't uh, live for something. You know? There's a story, guys, I'll share with you. There was a man, you know... I, this was from Atta. He said there was a grave digger that after many years, many years of just grave, uh, digging graves and seeing people transition and whatnot, <clears throat> a person comes up to this man, you know, he's become an old man, and asks him, uh, hey man, in all the time you've been working here, what's the most shocking thing you've seen? Like, what have you seen, like, working in a graveyard all these years? What's the most shocking? And the gravedigger looks at the guy and he says, What has shocked me the most is that I have endlessly seen everything from nature to people to everything die except the one who's watching. So he feels he's, uh, as this grave digger, he's observed change to a degree where he's noticed something has been changelessly observing that change. That's how we have that me who celebrates the birthday, you know, who blows the candle on the birthday cake, you know. You, we say it's my birthday. So the birthday is like, like a mask or an addition. There's something before as if when we say my birthday. So if we say my birthday, it's as if we were before birth. Like the, our language is even multidimensional. We say my mind. <laughs> language is uh, definitely has incredible architecture. You know, for me, a sentence has the same magnificence as seeing like, like the pyramids of Giza, seeing that architectural feat, or the Colosseum in Rome. You know, so, so it's like th there is. There's architecture to, f to anything of image. Because for me, sure, yes, I could totally see nature, you know, the love of the land, you know, the spirit of the world. But at the same time, it's, it's also just design and shapes and color and spacing. Do you see? So the design dimension is accessible, but then there's the, the narrative we paint over the dimension of design we see. So what it is, is we have thought that the context has to evolve for the concept to evolve. But now we're realizing the concept could go ahead of the context and evolve the context. <clears throat> and that's what I'm saying. It's so easy, again, to break a house of cards, but it takes a while to build it. So you see, to, for a person to see value in their life, it takes a while. It takes a lot of like small battles to at the end after some point midway through your life you looking and being like all right okay I got th I got this far you yeah. know in this wallpaper um, this uh, Japanese narrative of hero academia. Of course, it's, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's just the themes. For me, like every story has, a, again, a design, a blueprint. <clears throat> that means for me, biographies are technically just a complex geometrical shape on an empty page. 
like the story of the life of the person. It can be seen as just geometry. You can detach the inner realm from the outer realm by noticing the attributeless witness within. And you can also link the inner realms with the outer realms to a point that when you look at a squirrel, you're like, that's a squirrel. What else can I call it? Like, what else can it be? It's as if like the word squirrel is, is the word, the inner realm and the outer realm are it's so we wield, like welded together, you know? So that's the thing. For me, it's not like, yeah, everybody gets enlightened and escaped to another dimension. It's like we're not, we're not yogis in capes. We are uh, the modern human being. We are the neo-human. We are the human being who's uh, acting now. We are on stage. We're on the conscious existential stage. Now, most people on this planet, we, are, we have to go into a symbiosis. What does that mean? That means you're not <clears throat> the individual dimensions of life are simultaneously living with the collective dimensions of life. The same way we treat the individual, we're going to realize we need to treat the ecosystem because the only reason we're not taking care of the planet is because we think it's not alive. We think it's lifeless because emptiness has, has been the ultimate justification of any behavior. Remember, in an empty room, you can put anything there. <clears throat> this is why it's easy. Emptiness is easy. Non-duality is easy. We all are non-dual. That's the whole point of it. So there's no point of even trying to get to oneness. I don't know what people are doing. <laughs> You know, I understand the uh, I understand the value of the action in regards to like, all right, let's update the cultural program by being more of a loving creature in this planet. I understand that, but if it's like just the person for their inner realms, they want like. Here's the thing: it's like the person tried to become God, and the moment they did, they started laughing. Why? Because the wave and the ocean are not separate. Man's, the concept and the context are, it, it, you know what it is? It's a play, it's a game. It's not life. It's life that intensely. Let me tell you why. Because the more seriously you take this realm, the more seriously your uh, um, ejection from the plane of existence would be. When you're young, when you're young, yeah, take life seriously. A lion is not designed to 24-7 roar, but it is designed to roar. And I feel you see on YouTube so many people in, in smaller settings having different abilities. Like there was this life hack video I saw where it was just showing... Uh, this guy had found different ways to use, like, <clears throat> the pins of a Coke can or something, you know? And it was like, I was like, okay. That's the meaning of life right there. Because if you're suffering, the meaning of life is suffering. If you're in joy, if, you, if life is pleasant, the meaning of life is this pleasantness. But when you realize that if you want to base the meaning of life on the outer realms, it's like the rug is being pulled from underneath your feet all the time. Because I'm, the more sophisticated man looks at knowledge, it's more like an eagle flying higher and higher into the sky. Not an eagle uh, till the end of its life jumping branch to branch. It's not, that's not the point. The point is that when you fly into the sky... When you enter that non-dual state, from that non-dual ego vision, you see the whole force at once. Now you can know what, what to do it, you know, in some sense. Because intense ideas, you know how there's a saying, they say, if it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. 
sometimes intense, uh, extreme ideological fixations are like that. For me, I was like, all right, like, you know, some people update their phones, but why haven't we updated our moral system from just good and bad? Why are we still seeing good and bad people? Why haven't the psychologists made this way more complex? And let me tell you why. Because materialism denied the evolution of the new language, because you need the abstract to create. So the more materialistic we became, the less of an ability we had to create new language, because the less the inner realms were allowed to move. You see, on some level, you can judge a person and be like, yeah, that person is like this or that uh, person is like that. But on another level, it's just artwork. When I see another human being, it's like they're just an event, an expression. That's the human dimension. If we really wanted to act like human beings, our ideas wouldn't be more important than how life is occurring. So in life, there's no such thing I would say as success and failure. There is different angles. Because nobody has the same success and nobody has the same kind of failure. Because nobody has the same journey up the mountain. I mean, think about it. Eight billion people climbing a mountain. You think they're all going to have the same way up the mountain? Maybe in certain parts that you go the same way. You could say, if the lifetime is a journey, religious people, they found a staircase from the 6th century on the mountain. On the mountain of life. And they're just going up that staircase. You know, but, for example, the, the modern have jetpacks or something. You know? So there's different methods. You are an intelligent being. It's how the implementation uh, then evokes the meaning. So what I feel is going on is that there is a world that is moving and happening. And there is a self that is watching this world. And there's also a, another world occurring. So we are sandwiched between two moving worlds as a static self. An inner and outer realm, as I have. Designed that, those terms. Because really in life, I was thinking, does it have a final strategy? Like, is it that the religious people have stopped searching for a better strategy, that they've accepted that? Or even with the secular, has secular society just limited itself to the negation of the religious? That means it's as if, like, the person's looking at the atheist and you're like, okay, man, great arguments uh, about, for example, uh, the, la the, the, the falsity of man-made, uh, the, the early experience of thought. But I would say, it is at the same time, there is no input of the new. So there are certain ide ideological systems that exist which are, they stand on their own, they're painting a new story, and then there, is the, there are certain ideological systems that they're just countering it. They're just countering it. They don't have a position on their own, they're just the absence. You know how in the dictionary you go read what the, empty, what the definition of emptiness is? It's the absence of fullness. You go read what the definition of full, what is something being full, you know? What does it mean there to be existence everywhere? You know, like that, it, it becomes a sort of view where what is full is based on your ability to notice what was absent. So it's as if you appreciate the furniture because first there was the room, then there came the furniture. You consciously put the furniture in the room. So it's as if the way I feel maybe human life is coming across, uh, let's say globally, I'm going to attempt it. Let's say you know, I feel it's, it, the model will stand on a global level. That what I think is going on is a candle is being lit in the dark room like a person is entering a room they are observing what's going on in the room, then they're choosing a point of like, all right, this is what I accept from the room, then they're uh, acting on it. 
Because we have to keep our bodies in motion. That's the whole point of living. So for me, it's, it's as if, like, I totally understand. The, the more tr traditional conservative approach is like, hey, we shouldn't lose our ancient technologies. And the more liberal modern view, we got to let new technologies come into. And that's it. All political systems have just been that. Just what do we want to stick around? And it has to do with vision, I find. I mean, of course, the study of political science is, is history. You can't study politics without studying history. To be honest, you can't study anything without studying <laughs> Because history is like the skeleton, and the concepts you read in every book or whatever is like the nervous system forming. Because the question is, why should light beams entering the eyes of a creature lead to subjective attention? Like the intelligent design, how can we say the context? That means it's like somebody is judging you. Imagine person A and person B. Person A, imagine... Uh, Person A is in the park, person B comes and says to person B, how dare you be the first letter of the alphabet? Do you know? You don't deserve to be the first letter of alphabet, you know, to person A. You know, and person A, imagine, looks at person B and he says, why do you deserve to be person B? Why do you deserve to be the second letter of the alphabet? Do you see Judgment continues as far as the spectrum can st uh, extend. So what that means is the power of the intellect becomes an incredible ability to, like in, in the video game Assassin's Creed, have stealth. You can hide your honesty very well. But the point of life as an event is the honesty. So that means it's like I'm, I'm saying... Be unconditionally honest because you want clear information. You know, like the person wants an actual response from their moment. So they require honesty. Because honesty is only feared if you don't realize what it's doing in the long run. So honesty can be heroism. You being true to your DNA to some degree and actually realizing it's like a blank page and your potential is what you choose to write here. Do you choose to honor your members of your species or do you choose to dishonor? Because we all understand cause and effect. It still doesn't stop you from going after a desire. Right now, we're living in a point where I would say it's the artificial food er uh, era where the taste has sabotaged the quality. The taste has uh, possessed the quality. The taste of food has become more important than what the food actually is. And I'm saying on another level, the desire of the hedonistic anarchist, yeah, I'm going to be free and all that, that's like the taste possessing the quality of what kind of civilization are we building here. Does it make sense everybody does what they want or should we have like a certain 10% of every person's lifetime contribute to building their civilization? Like we got to work out some model as a global community, right? And I think that's the solution. I think the uh, you know human beings were like, oh my God, extinction's coming. What do we do? And the planet's like, all right, I'll gift you with the internet, human beings. You know, Gaian, the Gaian mind was like, all right, let's give them a network. They'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> that means the nervous system gives purpose to the skeleton, in some in a strange way. Is the mind of the skeleton? Is the soul of the Okay, that's too deep. <laughs> is the mind of the skeleton. 
let us say, the nervous system. Just if, if, it, if there was only a skeletal system being compared to a, ne a nervous system only, without any other dimension being considered. <clears throat> so I'm saying the modern morality is either going to go towards the one organism angle, that means we're all cells part of the same human body, either we're going to unite as a species, the species is going to find itself uh, through the body of civilization we're going to feel yeah we're all cells in the you know working in the same brain we're all, we're all neurons in the same uh, cosmic brain you know or whatever so so we have that unification strategy or we have we find the mind of the civilization before the body of civilization the mind of civilization is not from a dissension angle it's, sorry it's not from an ascension angle the mysticism and yoga is more like you being so honest that you remember yourself before yourself. You know? For me, if everybody used, let me say, let me just navigate. If everybody's idiosyncrasies, uniqueness, unique things they see or abilities they have could somehow be given a value. Imagine like we found a technology that could make whistling like into these giant sound waves, okay? And so we, people who would recruit who were being, let's say, I don't know, in, in the sci-fi setting being recruited, you know, for like the military were people who were good whistlers. And they would come there and they would just whistle. And so whistling had become like the next soldiers of mankind, you know. Like, <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm saying it would be something small having massive value. So how we do this is by zooming in on our inner realms and zooming out from our outer realms. Uh, that means in front of your eye, look at matter as if the eagle flying above the forest was seeing the whole forest. And look at your inner realms as if you've sat on a branch. Because that's how the rhythms comes across. The rhythms of the inner realm. Because on one level, you're like, yeah, that's imagination. How, look at how creative, you know, the thoughts, that guy came up with that thought. But from another angle, it's as if, imagine the mind is like rivers of endless forms moving. And it's just that the person just like show, uh, uh, shine the candle, the flashlight on that like um, uh, waterfall. You know what I mean? It was like a movement. So I've, that's why I'm saying the antenna approach is going to be the mind of civilization, recognizing that instead of us being uh, the underdog, it's as if there is no... F Here's the thing. What is there to lose before there was the concept of loss? That's how the silence of nature speak so loud. That means the heart can't be hidden even though the mind can. That means you can tell your heart to stop beating but the heart's like, buddy, can't you see I'm busy? <laughs> And that's the hard problem of consciousness. Why is it that certain um, activities we have conscious choice, certain activities we don't? Certain moments in life we're like in the passenger seat. <clears throat> certain moments in life we're in the, we are in the driver's seat. Certain moments we have to be the driver. We have to be the one to get in the car and drive. We got to care for the moment on a direct experiential level. So I would say the more within you go poetically, the more direct experience becomes a language of, um, of, of conscious journeying. And the more you go towards without, that's where the soul lives. The soul is a concept 
for the outer realms. The soul to itself, it doesn't, there's no idea. It's just an instantaneous being. You know? So for me, it's like we got to understand. We're just creatures that have popped out. As Alan Watts says, it was like the world app, uh, the tree appled, the planet peopled. Now these people are implementing strategies towards an effort. That's it. Everybody's just trying as far as I'm concerned. Whatever, even the bad guy, the good guy mentality, they're all both trying something. So it's like you could see energy is being used, the effort is there, but the direction is the problem. So good and evil is another way of saying, well, how are you directing your attention in this lifetime, in this world, in this realm? Like it's, that's the fascinating thing. There's some parts of life when you climb a mountain, there's some parts of it that you got to be cautious. Like I, I've, I've experienced, even though this isn't something I would advise, but I've experienced like in my youth, it, there was a certain level of savageness open to me because of a lack of limitation, like limiting belief that it was like, I remember I would run down hills as if it was like an obstacle course. So every life is an effort, ultimately. It's like there's a binary purpose to it, on, off, right? Effort, no effort. That's the most basic way, you know? Uh, then it's after we got that, let's say we went through that binary phase of effort, no effort, then it became direction. It, we, we, life became like velocity, and that's the whole point of the heroic society, that it is conscious of the collective direction, the collective advancement. It's like you don't want to just see people win. You want to see civilizations uh, achieve victory. Even though the all per there is never perfect victory, there's no system in this life that is perfect. And if it was, it would be weird. It would be as if like uh, unnatural. So I would say it's very easy. It's so much easier to see an anarchist society. Yeah, it's so much easier to uh, set a forest on fire. But it, it takes, it's much more, it's like that's the stronger will that can see the value of what has endured so far. Nature is divine. Because the only thing that separates divinity is the linguistic simulation. This is why there's the story that this missionary priest went to this like chair like that went to this town to, you know, to spread the truth. Um uh, uh I don't remember the town. But anyways, there was this story that this uh, Christian missionary, this priest, back in the day, back in the day, um, he goes to this, Chero this town and there's a Cherokee member, a native person who's decided to integrate, you could say the most like innovative native, you know, who has, who has um, come to like society and whatnot. And the priest goes to this native and says, you have to believe in Jesus Christ or you would go to hell and this Cherokee is like what are you talking about the, the person is like what are you talking about? and the priest says this is the situation and tells them the whole you know um, Abrahamic narrative and the person suddenly the native uh, man said, suddenly says, what happens to children? Do children go to hell? He's smart. He's asking, he says, what, what, do children go to hell? You know, young children who don't know anything yet, do they go to hell? And then the priest is like, no, they don't go to hell. After the guy. And then the guy's like, then why did you tell me? Do you see? 
If you don't know, you can't make a mistake. It's an accident. But if you know, you can make a mistake. And the whole effort is just collective conscious living. I mean, what else can it be? It's not like we're doing something too advanced. It's just like you see birds in the sky rhythmically fly together. We're like, all right, we're human beings. Let our minds fly towards the vision of an advanced civilization. You know? Guys, there's a quote by Gerard Way. He says, Heroes are ordinary people who make themselves extraordinary. Why? Because the world deserves its better option. That's it. That means you want to... There was a, something in this narrative, Shingeki no Kyojin, where there was this commander in a battlefield and humanity was going extinct. And the soldiers were all scared and it was like uh, kind of uh, they were all going to die. And one of the soldiers says, sir, are we all going to die? And he's like, yeah. You know, and then the soldiers like, uh, so what? So does this mean it's, it was all for nothing? It was all meaningless. Does this mean life is meaningless? Then the commander says, it means that it, it, he says every, every way. I don't remember the exact words, but it was something like. Life is not meaningless. We find meaning by living for those who will find the meaning one day. And that's the, where the extraordinary dimension comes when you actually feel the moment deserves its advancement. The new ethos for human civilization would be like the Gaian ideological Iron Man suit. The collective, the Iron Man suit of the species. Because so far, we have external technologies, as I've classified. Those who Elon Musk is, like, I consider him to be, you know, uh, uh, in the front lines. 
and many others, of course. But in, when it comes to inner realms, internal technology, technology that has to do, in, and inner technology is language. So we want to, at the same time, yeah, have like advanced oh, technologies accessible in our modern time. But at the same time, we should have the user of technology become advanced. And it's not enough just to tell children to learn code. That is not of an enough strategy. There has to be an engagement with an emergence of a coll collective morality, which is not based on story, but is based on practical life sensitivity, based on the declaration of the highest values at the time. Christopher Reeve says, a hero is an ordinary individual who finds the strength to preserve and endure in spite of overwhelming obstacles. Yeah. You know, how, how dare the obstacle uh, uh, persevere uh, and you not? <laughs> Oh my God, this is a good quote. William James, act as if what you do makes a difference. It does. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson, a hero is no braver than an ordinary man, but he is brave five minutes longer. <laughs> yeah. Maya Angelou says, and oh no, I think I read that, a, a, a hero is any person with the intent to make a Make this a better place for all people, yeah. Let's see. Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama. 14th Dalai Lama. The true hero is one who conquers his own anger and hatred. Yeah, when you when you when the world is no longer your enemy, that's when uh an honor uh Uh, opens like a lotus, becomes a, a dimensional value, becomes a value. It becomes like honor. It doesn't make sense if you think of it just on a uh, on a story level. But when it comes to actually living for um, a vision, that's where the strength comes. You know, that's why even human beings go into groups. That's why religions are like. There's temples and whatnot, you know, because in groups we feel we know more what's going on. But being individual is, is the challenge because everybody is an individual regardless of moments of being in, in groups or whatnot. So imagine advanced civilization having both a, a, an advanced approach to what it means being an individual and what it means for a collective a human uh, uh, species emergence you know of intention and movement so th that's like it's all about the attention being the steering wheel of the species and it's the attention of eight billion people if we all started paying attention to cat videos yeah that would be our civilization it's as if our civilization deserved to just be cat videos but if our civilization deserved to get ready that in case I, I know that in Fermi's paradox, we are like, where it's like a big thing in philosophy where we're, like, we're like, where are the aliens? Where are they? Like, what is this? Why is it so empty? You know, why is life on planets but not everywhere else? You know? So it's, there's this situation where we should assume, let's say if there were, would we be ready? Would you, does, do, like, they should do a survey. How many people feel... We as, we as human beings are living in a way where we deserve an interstellar civilization or not. You ask many people, inter do you deserve an interstellar civilization? It's for the first time. They're like, what? They're, it's like, that's possible? I didn't know that was a who wants to be a millionaire choice. You know? <laughs> like that game show, you know. So that's the thing. In this life, there isn't really an instruction booklet. You're a unique DNA, a unique instrument. You master your inner realms. You find a contentment with the unknown. Then you work with the known. So my view is 
instead of us we're, like thinking we're the known and crying when we go into the unknown, we should have this attitude where the unknown, we can't have a reaction. We don't know what it is. That's why it's so pure. You know? That's why it's uh, the person who doesn't know is so innocent. You know? Even the angels are like, look, this person doesn't know. They're even a person. <laughs> there's, um, there's a work of art I'm going to show you before I end off, guys. It's, it's, um, I consider it to be a sort of master, uh, masterpiece of, it's pr like pretty much, for me, not judging his character, I don't know who the guy was, like, like his personality, but I know that the contribution of uh, Michelangelo, he was the, one of the most advanced communicators on this planet. Uh, here's the picture. Oh, there we go. I found the picture, guys, finally. This is, um, this is in, uh, on the Sistine Chapel. This guy drew this on a ceiling. So uh, if you look at the uh, <coughs> video, guys, you'll see the picture. So if you notice in this picture, the guy is not looking at God. The, the person to the left doesn't see the archetype of the collective. Do you know? So the person is just, his, his, you see his hand, it's as if he's just sitting there. He's just waiting. He's just chilling there doing nothing. And so it shows how beyond the veil, where beyond the void, there is the suggestion of, I mean, that's the whole point of the curtain. You see the curtain? That's the veil. The veil of thought Alan Watts speaks about, it's that, the curtain. Or you can say that space between the three I don't know what century this guy drew this, but it was like, the whole point of it was the heroic society would be the collective. So imagine civilization, overall view becomes like the right picture side and the individual is like the left side. I don't know, guys. The whole point is, like, potential is very close. I don't know. That's the, That was the moral. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, whoever's listened so far, thanks for tuning in. And um, Q&A and philosophical, further philosophical discussion will be held on Discord. So, thanks for listening, folks. This is the end of the talk. And one last thing to say. It's the direction of our effort. That means if we care for, we stop seeing 8 billion human beings as just 8 billion human beings, but as 8 billion human beings with unknown potential, 
And if we find a way, we become such a street smart civilization that, you know, we become such a street smart civilization that we notice that we can use our separateness and uniqueness to our advantage through a certain information processing networks, but through voice. So that means it's like if you want to transfer a file between two, like there's, there's that approach, and that, then there is language and communication being like one person with one way they look at the world and that other person with another way at the world speaking to come to a certain common ground. Do you know, so I see when you communication as actually co-creative world generation, where there's always two sides to the coin. So it's as if like when two people agree, they may agree to something, but they have different uh, approaches. It's as if two people uh, uh, agreeing that a picture is a good picture you know, a painting is a good painting, then at the same time, they're not agreeing it's good in the same way, though. One of them is thinks, like, the color was color choice was nice. One of them thinks the technique was nice. Do you see what I mean? So it's like, it's, it's, it's like we, we communicate uh, as long as it's enough to, to see enough similarity to advance the vision, I think. And yeah, you become a hero in your society, whoever you are listening, when you realize you and all the creatures, you deserve your existence. But you have to earn your experience. And that's where the purpose in life comes in. So, <clears throat> the strong have no reason to be dishonest. The weak, like, like I would say when it, comparing the samurai and the ninja, the samurai could walk anywhere the samurai liked, the ninja couldn't. The ninja had to be in the shadows. If we care for civilization, if we care for the effort of the species, heroism would just mean we take care of each other's blind spots. Because really the linguistic simulation has, has to be kept. That means imagine suddenly there was this view where the whole species decided to become a silent. We decided nobody, like all the various nations, one by one, they decided to become just silent, no longer words. We no longer we speak. We would then at that point fight for language. But now we're in the opposite. There's so many ideological systems, so many ways to communicate that it's as if like the mystical teaching is like, yeah, silence maybe is the way. <laughs> So I'm saying regardless, the person on a design level is a communication of elemental intelligence and space and awareness appears field-like. Because the inner realms are like, uh, they, they're not the point, you know? The point of the inner realms is just to just to see how it, it's it's like the, the 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 your imagination is like a private office or another way i could say it let's say you're a child in a in a country that you don't have money to go to the movie theater and you've seen the ads outside and you're suffering you're this little kid who's never seen a movie theater 
and let's say there's no way life is cruel and you can't get any way to go into the movie theater to see a film. Now that child can endlessly continue and eventually go see a movie theater or that child can close their eyes, whoever you are, you can close your eyes at any moment and watch like an aquarium various ways that thoughts as if one by one are performing in your attention and p passing by. So for me, my inner realms, there's moments where they're like a river rushing really quick and there's moments where it's like a gentle river where you're sitting beside the harmony of your own nature. Because it doesn't make sense if we have heroes that sacrifice themselves because we're trying to make a world better world for everybody you know so if everybody's sacrificing themselves for uh, for a better world who's left who's left to experience that better world so it's not i'm not just saying we should have but i'm saying a heroic society would mean we re rekindle an acceptance of heroic honor i feel that we should we should create a completely new uh, metal metal classification system where if citizens go and help an emergency in the street, you know, they, they are given a certain medal where in society they get benefits. Where people, it starts making sense for them, even at regardless of how evil they are. Imagine you're an evil-natured person, but you're like, yo, man, if doing good stuff makes me more money, you know, regardless of how evil I am, I'm going to do the good stuff. So through the design, we could fix the morality issue by implementing a better design, a better narrative. So now more than ever, the world needs the philosophers, the poets, the artists, and pretty much all human beings to share your inner realms. There is no stage. Now is the, is the, is the performance, the great cosmic performance. Now is now. <laughs> you know? Like now is, is, is happening now. You know? <laughs> It's like they told the person, be here and now. And the guy's like, buddy, I've always, I'm already there. <laughs> it's like, where do you think we all are, you know? <laughs> so anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. Um, there was one thing I got to share. One last thing I, 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 I wanted to paint the picture. I didn't get a chance. In, in the wallpaper where you see these three characters in the hero academia, there was a thing about the hero sacrifice, the hero's body moving before their mind. That means it's like a society of heroes, and so the, the heroes, they, they are still competing with one another. Even though it's a society of heroes and everybody's doing, like the civilization is winning, you know? Uh, but there's still competition and complexity and dimension and challenges and hierarchies and whatnot, right? It's just that now people's overall outcomes are just lifting up the civilization rather than smashing it to the ground, you know? It's easier always to break something than build it. <clears throat> so the, the situation was that this character with the green hair, the one who's looking at the uh, viewer... <laughs> Um, Deku or something, is the character's name, is, is the character's name. This character starts off in the narrative having no power, but having the heart of a hero. Not having the ability of a hero, but having the mind of a hero. As if, as if, or, or I could say more poetically, the soul of a hero. That's when his body, that, that means this character constantly keeps throwing himself not intentionally not not it's his, it's like his nature uh his, his he he it's like the being hears their heart before their mind the body moves in accordance to their person's uh nature their true nature you can't that can't be hidden that's the cool thing Whatever you are in this life, there will come a moment where you will notice it. <laughs> so this character would run into situations. He, would, he had no ability, but there was an event where he just knew the comrade didn't need to be alone in the battlefield. 
So if 8 billion people have a mentality, why not? Let's see what an advanced civilization looks like. Let's see what a win-win strategy properly implemented as a prototype of a better civilization will be. Because similar to how we can't have the birds and the squirrels come and build our advanced civilization, the same way we can't have saviors to come and change our attitude. We just have to update ourselves by looking good in the mirror, like pol uh, polishing the mirror and looking in it. You know, certain moments, there's been certain moments where it, it's very, I have, how would I say it? I mean, I've been like in just in nature sitting and a thought has arose and the thought has suddenly started to transform maybe either towards a more, um, uh, darker angle, more chaotic angle, or a sort of um, perversion of the the innocence of the idea or whatever, just in my inner realms. And I've exiled the thought. That means it's like you can stop, so you can, when you realize the attention is you, then the content of the attention no longer becomes a source of fear because you're you are the source of the attention like you are your presence right now so a heroic society cares for the sensitivity of life for 8 billion tourists and manifestation where the pur purpose of it is like all right let's just increase the quality of this journey we this temporary journey even though evolution is like the most eternal idea ever because evolution is the urge to continue existing and it's this un we 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 ascribe it to survival like as if the creature is, is hungry to exist continuously but at the same time to continuously exist is an urge of eternity is an attempt at eternity so we can say the concept of eternity is as ancient as evolution itself And so, a hero, there is the idea you can have of what it means, or it's the person who just, we have advanced, able human beings walking this planet, and when they see a challenge or a conflict or a situation, they, ha they are advanced. Do you see? That means you can help the victory of the moment. That means there's the saying, they say, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Well, guess what? Everybody's enemy is time and the forces of nature. So when somebody is, is like in a river, you help pull, pull them out. That's the thing. Because it's worth seeing. It's even the most, you can be the most, you can have the most selfish argument to be self, selfless. The reason the evil guy did the good thing was just to have a really good thing to be evil in. You see, it could be self. There could be a selfishness. You can sit, tell the dictator, "Hey, dictator, why are you controlling an unupdated civilization? Build an advanced civilization, so then attempt to control." You see, because it's a negotiation with forces that are beyond control. If the system is very scattered, so just like in psychology, we there's the, a sort of lens of looking at a person as if their psyche is fragmented, you know, and that sentence is nothing to be afraid of. You know, I will say that's nothing to be afraid of because every, life is fragmented into different states where you were conscious and your brain like a camera was recording it. So fragmentation is normal. It's like the space between the sentences, you know, but the issue with the fragmented psyche is when the person is in, they don't see the singularity of the outer realms and the importance of it. That means it's like the, it's as if like the argument to the immaterialist is what's wrong with matter? And the argument to the materialist is what's wrong with the material? What's wrong with space? What if what's wrong with space being a body for intelligence? And it, this, some people just call it that soul. The word soul in many cultures, it derives from the word breath. Well, and there's different explanations. One, the word is like, you know, from an Abrahamic context. The other is because people would see when a person would die back in the day, the breath would leave. 
It's as if they would stop breathing. It was as if somebody stepped out of the vehicle suddenly. And so you could say there was a sort of metaphysical, unavoidable archetype that emerged from there. Because if we say we're a symbiosis of, a, of, of a, uh, uh, let's say, René Descartesian mind-body dualism where the mind is doing its thing and the body is doing its thing, you see we can cross-link the purposes, we can separate the purposes, but on some level, it's like when a, when a thought becomes too malleable, you also feel it's, it's, it's like a bit out of place. Pretty much, we need to tell ourselves a better story where our civilization is not, doesn't have its attention stuck in, in a looped way on its inefficiency. That's how you build a self-sustaining system. You shout at the system, do you deserve something better? If yes, move. If not, stay where you are. If you feel you deserve an advanced civilization, then you also deserve to attempt it. For me, an advanced civilization, guys, I, I keep going to this point because it's the most ultimate idea. That what else do we do? What else can we do? That means if you're a materialist, it's as if the only thing is the advancement of civilization. If you're an immaterialist, the advancement of civilization is a rare opportunity. So in both angles, it is... It makes sense to build an advanced civilization. It's the ultimate win-win idea. It's the bingo moment of uh, our species. That in order to build an advanced civilization, like if you thought, imagine we just, uh, there was an advanced civilization built and we're like, wow, is this advanced civilization ours? Like new tenants to a, a new... Uh, buyers of a house. Oh my god! And then we suddenly realize it's like this advanced civilization requires an advanced user of the civilization. An advanced communicator, an advanced individual member of civilization. So it's as if the moment you want to judge intelligence, imagine you're someone your intelligence has been judged. Okay? You'll be like, okay, thanks. What part of it are you judging? How are you judging it? Where is the judgment's imagery arising from? What is the actuality of the situation? All these angles means that we can always um, uh, see more when it comes to the conceptualization of, of, of the subjective realm. Or whatnot. So anyways, guys, care for your world because you're in it once. Much blessings and namaste. I'll see you in the Discord server.